All right, you modern humans. In this episode, we deliver the socialism speech by Keir Hardy. This is Speaking Through the Ages, where we bring back the dead in an attempt to bring out the values, beliefs, and internal struggles of those humans that came before. We give context to and deliver historical speeches that motivated people to kill, riot, make salt, and sign papers. I'm Joseph Delio, your novice history fan. To join us, subscribe and click the bell for notifications. In the late 1800s, socialism was on the rise. And Keir Hardy, considered today as a Labor Party legend, preached, campaigned, and wrote for the idea of a more equal world. A more fair world. Keir Hardy came from and knew the working class. He was working at the age of seven, lowered into the mines at 10, and educated his mind by night. By 20, he was a veteran miner. By 23, he was a full-time union labor organizer. And in 1892, he became the first independent labor member of parliament for West Ham. In, 19, in 1900, he became one of the main leaders of the Labor Representation Committee, which became the Labor Party. Keir Hardy would be re-elected in 1901 for a mining community in South Wales. And it was then, in the House of Commons, on April 1st, 1901, when he would deliver the first complete socialist speech made in that chamber. I make no apology for bringing the question of socialism before the House of Commons. It has long commanded the attention of the best minds in the country. It is a growing force in the thought of the world, and whether men agree or disagree with it, they have to reckon with it. And they may as well begin by understanding it. I begin by pointing out that the growth of our national wealth, instead of bringing comfort to the masses of people, is imposing additional burdens on them. We are told on high authority that some 300 years ago, the total wealth of the English nation was 100 million sterlings. At the beginning of the last century, it had increased to 2,000 million. And this year, it is estimated to be 13,000 million. While our population during the last century increased three and a half times, the wealth of the community increased over six times. But one factor in our, in our national life remained with us all through the century. And it is with us still. And that is that at the bottom of the social scale, there is a mass of poverty and misery equal in magnitude to that which obtained 100 years ago. And I submit that the true test of progress is not the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, but the elevation of a people as a whole. I admit, frankly, that a considerable improvement was made in the conditions of the working people during the last century. At the beginning of the 19th century, the nation industrially was sick almost unto death. And it was at this time passing from the old system of handicraft under which every man was his own employer and his own capitalist and traded direct with his customer to the factory system, which the introduction of machinery brought into existence. During these 100 years, the wealth of the nation 
accumulated. And the conditions of the working class, as compared with earlier years of the century, improved. But I respectfully submit to the House that there was more happiness, more comfort, and more independence before machinery began to accumulate wealth. The high standard of comfort reached by the laboring class at the end of the last century has not brought them that happiness which obtained in England 300 years ago, when there was no machinery, no large capitalist, no private property in land as we know it today. And when every person had the right to use the land for the purpose of producing food for himself and his family. I said that an an improvement was made during the century, but I would qualify that statement in this respect, that practically the whole of that improvement was made during the first 75 years. During the last quarter of the century, the conditions of the working class has been practically stationary. There have been a slight increase of wages here, a reduction of hours there, but the landlord with his increased rent has more than absorbed any advantage that may have been gained. We are rapidly approaching a point when the nation will be called upon to decide between an uncontrolled monopoly conducted for the benefit and in the interest of its principal shareholders, and a monopoly owned, controlled, and manipulated by the state in the interest of the nation as a whole. I do not require to go far afield for my argument to support that part of my statement concerning the danger which the aggravation of wealth in a few hands is bringing upon us. This house and the British nation know to their cost the danger which comes from allowing men to grow rich and permitting them to use their wealth to corrupt the press, to silence the pulpit, to degrade our national life, to bring reproach and shame upon a great people in order that a few unscrupulous scoundrels might be able to add to their ill-gotten gains. The War in South Africa is a millionaire's war. Our troubles in China are due to the desire of the capitalist to exploit the people of that country as they would fain exploit the people of South Africa. Much of the jealousy and bad blood existing between this country and France is traceable to the fact that we went to war in Egypt to suppress a popular uprising, seeking freedom for the people in order that the interest of our bondholders might be secured. (sighs) Socialism, by placing land and the instruments of production in the hands of the community, eliminates only the idle, useless class at both ends of the scale. Half a million of of the people of this country benefit by the present system. The remaining millions of toilers and businessmen do not. The pursuit of wealth corrupts the manhood of men. We are called upon at the beginning of the 20th century to decide the question propounded in the Sermon on the Mount as to whether we will worship God or mammon. The present day is a mammon-worshiping age. Socialism proposes to dethrone the brute god mammon and to lift humanity into its place. And I beg to submit in this very imperfect fashion 
the resolution on the paper, merely promising that the last has not been heard of the socialist movement either in the country or on the floor of this house, but that just as radicalism democratized the system of government politically in the last century, so will socialism democratize the country industrially during the century upon which we have just entered. We hope you enjoyed this historical moment. Thank you for joining. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell for notifications. See you next time, where the dead teach. <laughs>